Oh, Kellen, we're not getting any sound. Uh, I hope that there wasn't a very loud, annoying click for all of you guys, but I also hope you can now hear me. Um, what I was very uh, mutedly saying a moment ago was, hi, hello, hi, good morning to all of my grade school friends. I'm glad to be with you guys today. And I was asking you guys a question. Do you ever have those days where you feel like you planned everything just right and on paper everything should have gone perfectly and you just can't seem to get it together and like you keep like 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 dropping stuff or things just aren't working out when you go to execute your plan for the day of like getting from point A to point B or making it to an appointment in time or whatever. There's those days and then there's days like today where I feel like I've been behind the eight ball and haven't had a great plan for my day since I woke up and yet we're here for grade school in what I'm gonna call on time for Colin because I'm always at least a minute or two uh, behind and everything seems to be working well other than my audio not going uh, live for a minute, but that's a fairly uh, understandable uh, problem that we were having since I had forgotten to plug the cable in. It's an important part of the process. If you don't leave grade school with any other knowledge today than that, make sure you plug the thing in. Um, so that's, uh, that's where I'm at. I'm in a good mood, I guess is what I mean to say, because despite feeling like scattered and like, oh my God, am I gonna make it to the studio in time for grade school and is everything gonna work out? Things seem to be working out just fine and nothing's on fire and uh, it's a beautiful thing. It's a good Friday and I'm excited to talk about color grading with you guys. My buddy Godali's here with me. What's going on, Godali? Oh, hey. hey. Uh, you know, no, just, just hanging, hanging here. Cool. Okay, I like it. Um, well, it's going to be a fun session today, guys. We're kind of in an AMA style thing. We've been, we've got a new episode coming out really, really soon. I swear, like any minute now. It's uh, an interview with Company 3 colorist Siggy Furstel. I'm really, really, really excited for you guys to check this out. We've been trying to you know, like just get everything zipped up and tidied up on that thing before we put it out live, but it should be out very, very soon, like in the next couple days. Um, so we've got that to look forward to. But in the meanwhile, we've had uh, kind of a down uh, week or so in terms of uh, pre-record content on the channel. So we're in like AMA mode today. We can talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. I've got a couple topics that are top of mind for me that uh, I'm excited to discuss if uh, time allows. But the floor is y'all. So get your questions ready. Let me know what you're thinking about, what you're struggling with, what you're curious about. And let's have some fun today. Um, Gadali, do we have questions yet or should I... Show you guys some cool stuff. Yeah. Well, well I, I, I want to see something, something cool. cool. We do have a couple have questions, questions starting to come, come in. in. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, do you have yeah, any, any default, default settings, settings or do you have any default, default profile, profile settings, settings, settings that irritate, irritate you when starting up, up? Or do you, or do you have, have presets um, to help, help you save you from doing, doing the same, same setup, setup on a project every time? time. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, so th I definitely have like preset projects. Let me save my screen. And by the way, would you guys let me know, how is my audio? I feel like when I'm looking at it on my meters right now, it's like hot to the point of clipping. So let me know if that's what you're hearing. We're trying to get it a little bit boosted from uh, last time where there was a general consensus that I was low, but I don't want to burn anybody's eardrums or clip out, so let me know. Um, in the meanwhile, let me share my resolve. And yeah, I mean, I definitely, like everything that I do is, uh, in the project settings here, the, the two like things that I have, the main one is just here. I just like have presets that uh, I have saved because the default preset definitely has a bunch of stuff that's wonky. So it's things like data levels and video formats and um, even like in my color management here, I have my Mac OS viewing transform just loaded in by default for my color viewer so that my color viewer looks somewhat close to my reference monitor. So yeah, lots of stuff like that that I've uh, gone in and gotten exactly how I like. And then once you've got stuff exactly how you like, you can say set current settings as default preset. And then that's gonna be the preset that loads up for you every time. Um, so that's like the main uh, thing that I have that sort of hacks through the uh, drudgery of having to redo the same settings over and over and over again. And then of course, like I've got my template node trees uh, that I use when I'm initially setting up my project. Um, so generally that'll be like, you know, if I had a, a project that was five shots long, I would just click on shot one, hold shift, click on shot five, and then uh, apply this empty node tree like so, so that I can, uh, you know, begin grading and kind of grade through in that process. So mostly power grades and then uh, project setting presets are kind of what come to mind when you ask that question. Uh, 
how would you approach color grading day for night, uh, especially in night exteriors? Also, any tips for DPs on set to help the colorist? Yeah, good, good. So I, I assume that the, the last part, uh, tips uh, to, for the DP to help the colorist, that's still pursuant to day for night. Um, it's funny we asked this because I'm, I'm actually working with this right now. I'm working with a film this week where for whatever like scheduling logistical reasons, it's a night for night sequence that's like nicely shot uh, and is grading up quite nicely. But the very first shot in the sequence is day for night or like dusk for night. It's not like it's high noon or anything. But it's really interesting because like it, it's been, it's challenging like to try to match it. Like you can... A day for night look doesn't necessarily have to look like it would have looked at night as long as it looks like night and the shots are consistent with one another, if that makes sense. But if you have a, call it dusk for night shot that rolls into a night for night shot, the dusk for night does have to look like the day for night. And like that's the, the challenge that we've been kind of trying to massage with this project. So I think like the biggest takeaway that I'm pulling from there is like, it's just all feel and the, it, a, it's all feel, and B, there are going to be cues that are tough to overcome. Like the biggest single cue, at least in the case of the shot that I'm talking about right now, that's like very fresh in my mind because I'm dealing with this the, with it this week, and uh, because it does happen quite a bit with day for night. The biggest single challenge is that the contrast ratio with like day for night stuff or dusk for night or whatever, it's going to be a lot softer than if you're talking about a true night for night where you've got a key and that key falls off much more quickly because there's not ambient light all the way around. Um, so in like the dusk for night shot, uh, the, sh uh, the frame of like the, the character, the, the frame that I'm talking about with the characters in frame, the light is much softer than even what we're seeing right here. Like it's very, very even because it's like in that sort of dusky twilight where like there's very little contrast ratio. There's just this last bit of ambience that's sort of like infusing everything in the frame. So the biggest challenge that's been bumping my eye is we go from that and then the next time we see those characters, they're getting a ratio that is like this or probably even more like what we're seeing here, for example, like a much higher contrast ratio. That's something that you can't fully fix. So it kind of comes down to like whether you're doing a matching exercise like I am or you're just trying to sell a day for night thing in general, you kind of have to get imaginative and you want to make it feel like night, even if it doesn't necessarily look like it would have looked had it been shot at night using night motivated light sources, if that makes sense. So like example of that, like let's use this shot. This one seems kind of difficult. Uh, so I don't know why I chose it, but let's give it a go. So I'm going to take my primary note here. This is also a great uh, like uh, example of a situation where it's kind of all feel driven. So like I could start if I wanted to with like some linear gain. Um, but in this case, I'm just going to work offset and then just start rolling things in with my primaries like so. And I'm, I'm definitely going to try to get like soft in the shadows. So like, let's see if I can make this a little bigger for you guys. And the other thing that I'm going to try to remember is like the thing that's going to keep bumping here is the color for sure. Um, there's a, there is a, there is a biological explanation for why all the moonlit scenes that we see and all the night scenes that we see in movies feel so monochrome and cool in nature. It's because that's actually the way our eyes uh, work when we're looking at like lower lighting, lower, lower light intensity, uh, like stimuli out in the real world. We switch over from one type of photoreceptor to the other and uh, specifically from our rods to our cones and or, am I getting that? It's one, one or the other. Uh, I, yeah, I believe it's we're switching over from our uh, like uh, rods to our cones, which are way less uh, color sensitive. So that's why we tend to perceive uh, night stuff as like much cooler and much more monochrome. And someone can correct me if I've got my rods and cones backwards, I might just. Uh, but in any case, like I think I've got a decent like sort of like grade on this and I'm gonna pretty quickly go over to my balance and start cooling things off like so. This is happening in linear gain right now. So we could do something like that. Another option that we could kick around that might be fun is I'm gonna extract this node uh, by hitting E and I'm gonna put it downstream of my sat node. And I'm gonna try prior to doing this cooling move, 
I'm going to try pulling some sat. This is like HSV sat that I'm working in right now. And I'm just going to try pulling some of that maybe, and then doing this uh, balancing operation. So it's also really tough because I've got like, there's lights on in this room and it, make it makes it a lot more difficult to assess images like this. So I'm going to try this. Let's just try rebalancing this from zero again. So we'll just go something like that. So like that's a good baseline. It's, and then like a lot of it comes down to like just dodging and burning stuff uh, as you can. Like one thing that occurs to me is like I'm, I have the luxury right now of treating this as a still image as opposed to a moving image because it is just one frame that I have here. But something in a frame like this that I might try to look at is like in a real night for night scene, I'm probably not going to see much of those trees back there across the body of water. So I'm going to try and kind of dodge those so that we are not seeing as much of them. And it's kind of tricky to figure out like what the best shape is going to be here. because I don't necessarily want to whack my subject. But you know, like something like that, and I'm just gaining that down right now. A lot of stuff like that uh, that you might need to do and you might even need to do in the case of something like this like you could do a layer mixer or uh, another node on the um, or another window on the same node in this case I'm going to do a layer mixer let me just clean up this node graph and I'm going to do a window for my subjects so that they're kind of getting left out of the bargain like so and now we can You know, might even need to do them separately like I'm going to do here. So it's like another principle is that like it's a lot of like just paying attention to what feels night-ish and what doesn't feel night-ish in the frame. And then trying to make the things that don't feel night-ish feel more so, such as like knocking down that background, making sure that I'm not hitting my subjects and kind of working through it like that. And like I said, I, I kind of picked a tough frame here, but this is like how I might begin to look at this. And I, what I might even do is like add another node here and try to dodge this portion of the frame as well. And of course, there's always like a general vignette approach that you could take if you wanted to do that. And maybe that's better. Like, let's grab a still on this. We'll just do a quick AB on that like so and maybe it's just like a general vignette that we do kind of tight but super soft and then we invert it and then we just start grading down like so yeah i don't know i think i i might like what i was doing before yeah, the before wasn't finished yet, but I think it was on a better track than what I'm getting out of the box here. So that's some ideas there. And then in terms of like DP helping a colorist, um, what you can do there. I think the best thing that you can do if you're shooting day for night, it's sort of the opposite of what we might, the advice I might normally give. The main thing I would say is, you know, make, make sure you're protecting your highlights. Like you want to make sure you're getting a healthy exposure, but that's going to be less of an issue if you're doing day for night and you know it's going to print down. The bigger thing is just make sure there's nothing that's in danger of being pinned because we're going to end up wanting to roll in everything. And if stuff is pinned to the ceiling, it's going to make it tougher to sell that day for night. Um, yeah, hope that's helpful. All right, All right. Max, Max is wondering, wondering how would you create a DCTL for D-Log M, M and maybe general, general thoughts, thoughts on unpublished log, log profiles? Oh, sure. Um, if you're interested in that topic, definitely would encourage you, if you haven't already checked it out, uh, to listen in on our last episode of Grade School where Thatcher joined me. Thatcher uh, is the smart dude who uh, did most of the research and implementation for the recent Phantom IDT. So for D-Log M, I'm trying to remember... I feel like we may have done some preliminary research into this. And Thatcher, if you're uh, in the house right now, you can uh, chime in and, and remind us if that is the case. But essentially, like, and Thatcher could even walk you through the process, but to put it in sort of like very simple terms, essentially what you need to do is figure out, okay, 
this image was encoded in unknown log format X. How do I get it back linear? Because remember, linear is sort of like the ground truth of everything. So what you're trying to figure out is how to decode that log curve. And you can do that essentially by taking exposure patches and saying, hey, here's, you know, like mid exposure, one under, two under, three under, four under, and then several, uh, you know, one, two, three, four, up and above. And you end up getting a range and then you can fit some kind of curve that allows you to decode that log uh, curve back to linear. And then if you can solve for the inverse, you also have the forward encode of that log curve. And that's how you would solve the log side of it. And then you would go through a similar process to solve for the primaries if those are also unknown. I don't remember with D log M if it's its own arbitrary primary set or if it's like P3 or something. It may be a published primary set, but if not, kind of same principle applies. And I'm like sort of oversimplifying uh, what I know Thatcher did for the Phantom IDT, for example, but that's the basic process. It's a matter of fitting like, okay, what do I need to do to this log encoded imagery such, as, such that these patches whose intervals I know because I shot them come back to being their original linear relationship with one another that they had out there in the real world. That's the basic process for kind of like solving for an unknown uh, log curve. And then after that, it's just uh, an easy matter of like implementing it into a uh, DCTL. But yeah, Thatcher, let us know. Uh, I, I, I know we've talked about D-log M, but I don't know if we've made any progress on that. All right, uh, let's see. When yeah, using, uh, when you use, use a color, color chart, chart to correct, correct an image, are you essentially, essentially changing, changing the color science of the camera to get the colors to look correct? When you use a color chart to correct an image, are you changing the color science of the camera? Um, that's not like a totally wrong thing to say in the broadest terms, but that's not the language that I would use to describe it. What I would say is when you use a color checker, like not even what I would say, like the most accurate, like, uh, specific way that you could phrase the question is that when you use a color checker, all that's happening under the hood is you are using a, you're getting a three by three matrix in, applied in a linear domain to fit these colors into what they should have been. It's essentially the idea there. Um, so if we go into our color checker and we go to fit this like so, I actually haven't done this for this image, but I, my hunch is that it's going to be a very, very mild correction because this is, I, I know it's uh, on the exposure side, a very dialed exposure. Let's actually zoom in and see what this, okay, so it's an x right, cool. And let's look at our, where is my color checker? There it is, last place you look. Um, so I'm going to say, Color Checker Classic or Color che Checker Classic Legacy. There's, it's kind of tough to know which one to pick. I'm going to go with Classic. Um, and then for my source gamma, we're already in DaVinci Wide Gamma right now. So I'm going to say DaVinci Intermediate, Target Gamma, DaVinci Intermediate, Target Color Space, DaVinci Wide Gamut. And then I'm just going to say Match. And what's happening under the hood here is I'm being given a 3x3 three three matrix and a 1D curve that fits these gray patches into the exposure uh, like configuration that they should live in, like to the value that they should have, and fits the color values into uh, a more accurate, more accurate reproduction as well. Um, so that's essentially what's happening. So are you changing the camera's color science? Not really. I mean, I guess you could put it that way. It's more like you are fitting a three by three, or not more like the, the more accurate, more specific way of stating it is that you are fitting a three by three matrix plus a 1D curve and then applying those things to the image. What do you, what think, do you think of, of Baselight's base new Chroma Gen tool? You know what? I have not had a chance to play with the Chroma Gen tool in person. I've gotten to see several presentations with it, and it looks really, really cool. I can definitely say that the concept that's driving it, the idea of building a scene-referred look, uh, you know, like upstream of your output transform, is very exciting to me and is right in line with something that I've been developing a plugin that we're going to be announcing uh, here on the channel really, really soon. Um, so I love the idea. From what I've seen, like there's, I'll put it to you guys this way, a tool like that, you say, okay, I want a tool that's going to allow me lots and lots of creative flexibility and creative power to create scene-referred looks. That's like the tool that I'm looking to do. 
building that tool is always going to be a balancing act between like, how do I as the designer give the user as much power and freedom as I possibly can, while also giving them enough constraint that using the tool is simple and intuitive and it's difficult to get ugly results with. Does that make sense? It's like a balancing act there and those things can pull against each other. So I would say one of the things I'm excited about uh, with this tool that we're gonna be announcing soon is I think it may strike a better balance uh, of those two sort of like uh, different priorities than anything else that I've seen that is uh, out there that's designed to do that. Uh, but that's kind of the balancing act there with Chromagen or any other tool like it is like, okay, it's what I sometimes refer to as control versus constraint. We want to give the user lots of control, but we also want to give them constraint so that it's not easy to drive the car off of a cliff, if that makes sense. Because having a, you know, like, I don't know if we I'll go with driving a car off a cliff. If, if, if I'm designing a racetrack uh, for someone, then it, it could be really fun and it could give the drivers like lots of creative freedom if there were no guardrails and they could drive right off a cliff. Like that would indeed expand the possibilities available to them as drivers. However, that's not a beneficial possibility to drive a car off a cliff, right? So you would generally want to put up guardrails against that so that you are somewhat confining the creative freedom to beneficial outcomes, if that makes sense. So I think similar things can apply with designing open-ended tools, creative tools, is you want to give lots of uh, flexibility and control, but you don't want to give control that only leads to undesired outcomes. Ben, ben wants, wants to know, to know if, if there, there are rules or guidelines for which primary uh, adjustments you should do when. Lift gamma gain versus log versus HDR palette. Oh, cool. Yeah, great question. So I think like the first thing I would sort of refer us back to to answer that question, like how should I know which of these controls to reach for? By the way, that's such a great instinct that you have that question and definitely encourage you to maintain that sort of attitude when you are thinking about color grading, you always want to, before you start reaching for knobs, it's the easiest thing in the world to reach for knobs when you have a bunch of knobs in front of you. It's a little harder to say like, hang on, which one should I reach for first and why? And is that going to serve me consistently again and again and again? Because that's really what I want here, not just one localized solution. So I would say what we want to find is the simplest solution that we can to our problem and a solution that's going to work for us over and over and over again. So which of these knobs should we uh, reach for first? My contention would be that you want to reach for your primaries first. Why? Primaries have been with us for the longest time. They are the simplest of any of the tools that we're, like, let's say, just for the sake of simplicity, we're talking about, okay, should I do my primaries? Should I do my log wheels? Should I do my HDR zones? Or let's throw in one more. Let's say our custom curves. Let's say, which one of these should I use? I can get good results with all of them. What's the difference? Which one should I go for? I'm gonna suggest the primaries because the primaries have been with us for the longest period of time. They're doing the simplest thing and therefore they're gonna cause the least problems and be able to get us uh, the greatest consistency of results. So within our primaries, then you can kind of ask the question again, like, okay, cool. Well, which of the primaries should I reach for first? And you, some of you guys may know, like here on the channel, I've kind of been going through a, a bit of a change in the way that I think about my practice in terms of being a little bit more fluid and less rigid about the way that I answer that question for myself and just saying like, eh, I'm just gonna like a little bit more naively, like if I were to give anybody with a good eye the mission of like, hey, make this look better using these. Can you guys see my four wheels? I don't know if you can necessarily see them, but that would be the, the sort of mission. If you were to give that to a person with visual taste, they might fumble around for a little bit, but they would eventually get to such a outcome, right? So that's the idea that uh, can be really helpful. Now, that's a very new sort of idea that I've uh, adopted. My more longstanding idea that I've like talked about lots and lots here on the channel is I find it really helpful to, if you're thinking about tonal adjustments, to think about exposure and contrast as different things. So. We start with exposure because it's more fundamental than contrast ratio, and then we work contrast ratio. So even as many of you guys know, in prior iterations of my uh, template node graph, I would, um, where is my button that I'm looking for? There we go. Um, I actually had these as separate things. So I would have exposure and then ratio, like so. So for exposure, 
I would do either offset, which is exposure like, or if you wanted to use your HDR zones, the, the one knob that I think is the most useful in the HDR zones is the global knob here. So you could use that one um, like so. Or you could use uh, what I tend to, which is for explicit, for a node that's only gonna be doing adjustments uh, of exposure, set my gamma to linear and use gain, which by the way is the same thing as that uh, HDR zones that we were just looking at. So you could do something like that for your exposure. And then for your ratio, that's where you could work either your contrast pivot or your lift gamma and gain, the things that are changing the relationship between tones as opposed to moving the entire signal up or down in an exposure-like manner. So that's kind of the idea there is like, all right, where do I want to start? I would say the primaries. Within the primaries, start with something that's going to let you adjust exposure. That's going to be either offset or even better, linear gain. And then from there, you can start to worry about relationship between tones. And then the same principle sort of applies for color balance. How do I know with color balance? Like, do I want to, this was like a big one for me when I first started grading. Like, I feel like everybody that I learned from was really big on kind of making a mess of their balance process. So they'd be like, well, it needs a little bit of warmth in the mids. And now we need to cool off the highlights. And now we need to add a little bit of green to the shadows. And I think part of the reason for all that complexity is because they were trying to get kind of the response of like a film curve. Um, let's just take a quick detour and I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to pull up a grayscale ramp here and you can see like with my, let's move this over here actually. With my initial effort here. And if I turn off my output transform like so, you can see like really what I was doing right here is I'm getting kind of like a film like split response from like where something different is happening in the shadows than is happening in the highlights. And I think that's one of the main reasons why a lot of the people that I learned from liked to work in this way is because they weren't necessarily working underneath a LUT or a look and they were just trying to get some filmy character onto the thing. So this is kind of like a poor man's way of doing that. Like you can see if anybody's ever looked at a film LUT, this is not at all the same, but a similar shape to what you'd see with a film LUT. Like if we look at, uh, you know, compare a Kodak 2383, it's got a whole big fat curve in there, but you can see that same sort of channel crossover and crosstalk. So I think that's why that was happening. But to go back to my main point, the that's like kind of, the way I was always taught, let me go back to this output transform. The, the, the colorists who I learned from were really big on like doing all kinds of different things across all kinds of different tonal ranges in their image. And what I found is the starting point, the sensible starting point would be like, well, what do I actually need to do? Let me turn this look back on. What do I need to do that can't be described by linear gain or offset? Just like we were talking about with exposure. Start with like, what, what's, what are the things that need to change in the entire image? Does the entire image need to be cooled off a little bit or warmed up a little bit? If so, start there before you start going like, well, the lower mid-tones need this and the upper mid-scale needs that and the shadows need that. Sometimes that can come about, but my general process with balance is like, by the time you get done fitting the overall, like I said, offset or linear gain into a good spot, you're kind of done. And if you want more like preferential, like look type things that actually should be done somewhere else in the node graph anyway. So if you're not trying to impart a look and you're just trying to balance out the image, most of the time linear gain or offset are all you really need to do that unless you're dealing with some really funky material, in which case you actually end up pretty quickly getting into the domain of wanting a different tool entirely. Uh, a tool that we just talked about a minute ago, a three by three matrix to actually correct colors in a more complicated way. Um, but that would be kind of my big long rambling answer on what to do first, second, third, and which tools to use. Start with your primaries, start with the primaries that affect everything in a sort of even blanket way, and then work your way into the primaries that only affect certain ranges of the image. Apply that same concept to both exposure and tonality, as well as your color balance. And that's a really, really good repeatable uh, sort of foundation to operate from. All right, All right, Vincent, Vincent wants, wants to know, what's, what's the best, best way to color manage? manage Who'd you film F log two so, so that I can accurately use Voyager and Kodak, Kodak Fuji Lux? Um, 
which I believe is not supported by default in Resolve. Yeah, so we've got F-Log now, but not F-Log 2. Uh, you're in luck. That's another IDT that uh, is we're going to be releasing really, really soon here on the channel. That's one that, uh, that's, that I think that one's, we finished that one, didn't we? I, I'm, using, I'm using the term we loosely. It's really like, spoiler alert for any of you guys who weren't here when Thatcher joined for the call. This whole IDT mission, like this is really like Thatcher's ball and I'm just kind of a cheerleader for it. Uh, and very happily so. Um, but I think we've we've wrapped up that F-Log2 IDT and we're going to be releasing it uh, very soon. So that's that's the best way, so stay tuned for that. Um, Emmanuel nice. is wondering if you have a breakdown of what to ask for uh, for a feature documentary in terms of delivery from offline editorial. Yeah, so I'm glad this came up because this is where we, we're, we're getting into like, that's a very detailed question and like figuring out how to ask those, how to provide that list of what's needed is like a big part of like building a successful color business as much so as like, oh, like you're so good in the box or you're so good in the room. So uh, what I would say is what you're going to want to put together is a prep sheet and uh, I have prep sheets that uh, I use in my business and in fact, uh, some of you guys may know, we have another round of my Colorist Career Accelerator course coming up uh, in uh, just a couple weeks here. And the express purpose of that course is to equip colorists who either want to start or to grow their professional color grading business, is to equip you with everything that you need to run that business and have it thrive. So that's not only your skills in Resolve, but things like how do I ask my clients for the proper turnover elements so that I can get things right the first time around. That's something that we cover in depth that is not an easy topic. It takes some time to digest, but we even uh, will equip you with some like template uh, prep sheets that we, you can use with your clients to figure out what to ask for. But the short answer is, it's a long answer. You need, it depends on the workflow that you're using. It depends on the way that you're gonna be delivering the project back to the client. And uh, it depends on uh, other factors as well. So. Ideally, you want to have a prep sheet or you want to have a couple of prep sheets for your different scenarios, but getting that built and getting it into a fashion that is comprehensive and also easy to understand for all different types of clients who might be editors, might not be editors, um, that takes time and that's a process, but it's very much worth undergoing. And that's one of the things that we talk about uh, at length in the Colorist Career Accelerator course. Mm -hmm. Ismail is wondering, what's your short or long review of the new XMP310? Do you see QD OLED sticking around? Oh, uh, yeah. So Ismail is asking about the, uh, the XMP310 that I have sitting over here on my right. Uh, I, I think I might have shared it with you guys here on the channel, but I know I've, I've talked with it, uh, talked about it with uh, friends, certainly, that like, it's great. It seems like a really great monitor. I love that I can get like full 1000 nit out of it, but I, sw I had a calibrated OLED monitor that was the exact same size here and then I swapped out for this one and it's kind of over underwhelming just because like it's doing its job just like the last monitor was. It's doing a slightly better job when I'm mastering HDR um, but that's like both that's like the best endorsement I guess I can give of it is that it's performing really really well. I haven't once thought about it since I switched it out it's just like doing its job that uh, my prior monitor was doing with the benefit of being able to master full HDR. Um, but yeah, I think the QD OLED thing uh, is going to stick around and uh, is hopefully the successor to uh, OLED going forward. Uh, but I'm really, really happy with the monitor. I will say like there's a couple things that I like, like for a variety of reasons. I actually saw we have a question about video versus full levels that maybe we can touch on in a minute. But for a variety of reasons, I sometimes have to switch between working in video versus full levels for certain workflows. So there's these presets here on my uh, the bottom of the display that I can use for so that I've got like... I can go full levels here, I can go video levels here, and then I can actually do a single click and switch over into HDR mode as well, which I am not going to do right off the bat because I don't want to completely burn up this monitor. But if I were to go to like P3D65 uh, ST2084, now I'm targeting 1000 nit, and if I switch over now, I'm looking at my equivalent reproduction in HDR. Um, so there's some nice things like that that are unique to uh, this monitor that were not available on my prior monitor. But in general, it's a great image, you know, like the, it's super well calibrated and I haven't noticed any like, I was sort of curious about like, am I going to notice anything different about the quantum dot tech versus OLED? But so far I can't see any difference at all. 
All right, right Timu is wondering um, about the video in full level uh, business in Rec. 709. They've seen contradicting info about the rel relevance of video levels in current times. Cool. Yes, yeah, so let's talk about video versus full levels. So here's the thing, guys. Like, there are so many different outlets for content today. You don't need me to tell you that. Like, there's so many different places that content can land, and there's unique technical specs for, like, every possible outlet that anything could ever go to, whether it's going to, like, a public broadcasting TV station or a YouTube or a film festival or any other place that it could land. Some of those places are going to stipulate that your image be in video levels, okay? And just as a reminder, when we talk about video versus full levels, this is a bit of a simplification, but essentially, video levels are a legacy uh, convention by which the image that was formerly allowed to go from zero, right here, to 100, within video levels, all you're doing is redistributing that data so that it fits in between 10 and 90. That's all that it's doing, okay? It's very simple math to move the image into that distribution or to move it back out to a full range distribution. It's a very simple mathematical proposition to go from one to the other. So here's my contention. Unless there is a specific deliverable reason to do it or unless you are working with a monitor or a device which demands it, just work full levels. It's just because that is the default distribution of the data, right? It's kind of like saying, you know, like, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of a great example or uh, uh, analogy off the top of my head. It's just one more layer of complexity that, like, sometimes is needed. Like, I deliver stuff all the time that, hey, it needs to be in video levels. Okay, that's fine. I'll deliver it in video levels. But unless that, level of, that layer of complexity is being requested, I'm not going to add it just for fun or on spec. Between the two, the more desirable is full levels because full levels involves no additional manipulation of the image, right? So my approach in general when I'm grading is I do everything in full levels. My project is in full, my reference monitor is in full, my client monitor is in full, and I grade everything full. Then if I need to deliver in video, I just go over and uh, flip it over into video on the delivery side There's because the math is very easy to do at that point. Um, the reality is I could also grade everything in video. Like I said, there actually are a few situations where I need to do that uh, just because of some of the devices that I'm using for uh, streaming out stuff for remote sessions. And in those cases, the result is the same. It's not like it really matters. So the truth is like the, the, the simplest way to think about it is like it actually doesn't matter as long as all the devices and all the software agree that, hey, we're in video levels or we're in full levels it doesn't matter. Everything is going to look identical. The only time it really matters is when you have a device that is expecting video but getting full or vice versa or uh, some situation like that where, where there's a mismatch. And my only sort of philosophy that I'm layering on top of that is like, well, if we don't need to arbitrarily scale the range of uh, data from 0 to 100 such that it fits between 10 to 90, then let's not. You know, but the truth is it doesn't matter. As long as all the devices agree, you're going to get the same end result. So hopefully that's a simple summary of a topic that like has got, had me upside down for like a long time when I was first learning about it or trying to. Uh, Irfan is wondering, uh, based on what criteria should I charge for color work, what's your, uh, what tips do you have for pricing your work? Ooh, we're, we're getting lots of questions that are, it, it's, it, it must be time for the Colorless Career Accelerator. It's another thing that we talk about a ton. This is another question that has no simple answer. We're not charging for, you know, we're, we're not in a strictly commodities business. You know, like if I want to sell a drum of oil, there's a, a market price for a drum of oil. I don't get to decide my drums of oil cost twice as much, or I'll give you a, you know, like the, there's, there's a fixed market price. It's a highly commodified or it's a, a commodity. Color grading isn't exactly a commodity. It can feel like a commodity if we're competing and we're trying to, uh, you know, like outbid other people who might want to do the same work that we want to do. But ultimately there's lots of room for negotiation and lots of room for deciding with our client, what is the value of this to you? And what is the value of this work uh, or of this compensation to me? It's a much more fluid and much more dynamic thing. 
So how do you decide how to bill for your work? I'm trying to think of like a, a short answer. Here, like one good place to start would be to look at the Blue Collar Post Collective survey uh, that they do, uh, I think annually, and they'll actually show on the whole, what is a freelance colorist in this market making as reported by the survey participants? Or what is a staff colorist making in this market on the whole? The thing to be mindful of is I think those numbers are really, really low. Um, I, I, I would use those as a floor rather than a guide point. I would say, well, if I'm operating at a professional level and I'm doing professional work, which again, that's uh, something you can uh, confirm and get built up in your practice by, by doing the Colors Career Accelerator course. But if I'm doing my work at a professional level, I should never be charging less than this. Does that make sense? Don't use that as your ceiling. Don't even use it as your median. Use it as your floor to say like, well, I would never charge less than this amount for a freelance colorist in this market, if that makes sense. So it's ultimately a very fluid conversation and it's something that I'm like sort of having renewed interest in right now and I'm in the midst in my business of completely overhauling and rethinking the way we do sales, the way we assign value, even the way that we provide estimates and say like, well, our rate is this or our costs are that. These are all things that we can solve or decide on for ourselves as business people. And uh, there are better solutions, I think, than a lot of the ones that I've been working with for a long time of like, well, here's my rate and it doesn't matter if you're, you know, like Coca-Cola or, you know, a student filmmaker, I'm going to bill you the same rate. Um, there's more sort of interesting ways to think about those things. So pricing is a fascinating subject with no short answers, but I would start by looking at, you know, like what are, what, what do you see in things like that survey? Can you gather any data about the people you perceive are your competitors, what they're charging? Uh, but ultimately you want to get to a place where you're just deciding with your client, hey, here's the value of this work to me as the person doing the work and what is the value of the work to you and coming to some sort of uh, alignment uh, on those uh, numbers. Uh, a couple related or questions about education. One, uh, how to learn color as a beginner and two, how does one learn look dev? Ooh, these are such good questions. Yeah, how to learn color as a beginner. Here's the first thing that I was, I mean, actually look dev and learning color as a beginner. My first answer, my first instinct there, like a good way to learn the way that I learned those things is like, just jump in. Like just here on this channel alone, I can't vouch for any other channel, although uh, I, I will uh, shout out, I'll, I'll, I'll give one caveat there. Uh, my buddy Darren Mostyn has a great YouTube channel. He's got great, lots of great content on his channel. We've got lots and lots of excellent content here on my channel. If you do nothing else, but just dive into Darren's channel and into mine, that's a great place to start as a beginner. And it's going to feel overwhelming. And you're going to feel like you're gathering all of these disconnected ideas and techniques and uh, notions at first. But pretty soon you're going to start to see them connect and you're going to start to form somewhat of a idea of what color grading is. So that's a great place to start as a beginner colorist. Similar for learning look dev. The best place to start is just kind of by diving in and like the, with look dev, the challenge is that it's, there's not nearly as much information out there, good information out there on the topic. What is out there, a lot of it is here on the channel. So you can uh, look up think videos here to get started, but the same thing there, dive in and just allow it to overwhelm you, allow it to wash over you. And then in both cases, if you're wanting to go further, certainly like with LookDev, we have uh, an advanced Shola design course that we launched last year that we uh, right now make available for alums of the Colorist Career Accelerator course that I mentioned earlier. So there's that path that you could take of like, hey, I want to go from beginner colorist, maybe build up to pro colorist, maybe build up to LookDev. That would be a path that you could take. And I would say like you want to be a very accomplished colorist and you really want to understand color grading really well before you tackle LookDev because it's going to help you to understand look development. Um, but those would be kind of some of the things that I would look at there is like dive in for uh, beginner color grading, dive into Darren's channel, dive into my channel for beginning look dev, dive into uh, my channel here specifically. That's probably going to be the best information that you can find on, uh, you know, like really, really good look development. And then you can start to look at uh, some of these additional resources that we offer when you feel like the time is right for you to do so. Um, what's your advice for color grading on a MacBook Pro display? 
Oh, color grading on a MacBook Pro display. Uh, I would definitely check out the, uh, uh, the video that we did on this subject where we end up using this Mac OS viewing transform. That's going to get you the best result, especially if you are, uh, you know, like following all the instructions that I gave in that video that uh, I won't go through the full thing right now because it was one of my longer videos, I think, like, you know, almost 20 minutes. But that's going to be the best way to get a somewhat reasonable reproduction of your image. That's, of course, no substitute for uh, a reference monitor and uh, no substitute for calibrating your display. But if you're using a MacBook Pro and you follow the instructions in that video, you will get, you know, like what I'm seeing here, which is, hey, you know, $10,000 reference monitor on my right and, you know, like Mac Studio display uh, or Studio display uh, on my left. And after applying this LUT, these two are pretty well uh, in sync with one another. They agree, at least in terms of baseline contrast and color reproduction. So I definitely point you to uh, that video. Maybe someone can find a link and paste it here in the chat if that's uh, helpful for you. Uh, Alexander is wondering, any thoughts on how to approach uh, tinting neutrals towards blue without committing crimes on the color cube on a look dev level? Oh, this is fun. And I'm about to get super self-conscious because I just saw that Joseph Slomka is in the house. Welcome. We're, we've, we've got, uh, uh, did, did everyone enjoy uh, my conversation with Joseph that uh, we featured here on the channel recently? That was one of my favorite ones. I'm so glad you're here, Joseph. Um, and now I'm going to be extra bashful about answering look dev questions because Joseph is here and Joseph has uh, got some serious game in that area. But I would say uh, for tinting neutrals, here's the thing. Like, I talk about in look dev, like, hey, in general, when you're building like scene referred looks, you don't want to just flippantly move your exposure up or down, right? When you're building scene referred looks, you don't generally want to like, bias your neutrals like way in any direction without being aware of it, right? But here's what I would say. If that's your intent, if that's what you want to do, then no one's going to arrest you for doing that. It's just something you want to do explicitly in the same way that like I might build a look that pulls a stop of exposure that remaps 18% gray to be a stop lower than you would expect it to render. There's no law that says I can't do that. The only thing that is not advisable is to do your look dev in such a way that you don't even know when you're moving exposure and you don't even know when you're biasing your neutrals in a problematic way. So that would be item number one. It's like if you actually are like, no, I want my, my neutrals to render as cool, then you should render your neutrals as cool and use whatever tools work for you uh, to do that. The other thing that you can look at is it may be that you don't want to do hit all of your neutrals with that type of uh, tinting. If you look at like, you know, one of my Voyager LUTs here, just as an example, the entirety of the, uh, I'm going to go into the Voyager Pro Pack here, and I'm going to go into the tone uh, modifiers. All of these tone modifiers are going to, let's just get a grayscale ramp up here. All these, these uh, tone modifiers are going to bias neutrals, but they all do a similar thing in that they all have this kind of cutout around mid gray. Can you see what I mean here? Let me make this nice and big for you guys. So this thing is like doing a whole bunch of stuff. Oh, let me turn off the, I think I have another look going on here, which is doing the same type of thing. But like, check this out. So we're like, okay, we're going cool in the shadows, warm in the highlights. But there's this cutout right here around mid gray where nothing is happening. That's intentional. That's on purpose because my convention here is I'm like, okay, I like the color separation and the color harmony that I can get from cooling shadows and warming highlights. However, I don't want that to affect areas of middle exposure where my subjects and where people's faces and skin are likely to be. I want those to sort of pass through untouched. So this can be one way of looking at it. And you could also look at only doing one side of this. Like if you wanted to sort of do your own version of this here in Resolve, you could use something like this. Take my DaVinci Wide Gamut Gray. This is my exposure chart DCTL that uh, you can grab as a free download. I'm just going to use this to sample a control point on my custom curves. And let me turn my scopes off for now, and I can get rid of this for now. And I'm going to say just above mid-gray, let's, let's call it just below mid-gray, all I want to do is pull red. If I pull red, I'm effectively going to get cyan, right? And you can see, even with, I might need to do another control point because this resolves custom curves are kind of janky. 
But once I anchor this so that I'm truly confining my operation to only happen to the left of this control point, you can see I'm doing this big fat cyan push that is 100% affecting my neutrals in a big way, but it is stopping prior to mid gray. And if I turn my output transform back on, like that's obviously way too much of it, uh, or I would say it's way too much of it for my taste. So this is where I could look at like, all right, let's back it off. And I, I can also just hold down option and choke this point down and sort of decide how far down the tone scale do I want to wait before that influence of cyan starts to come into the image. And again, this is where I'm bumping a little bit into like the limitations of the uh, custom curves here in Resolve. But if I take this second control point and kind of bring it down to choke it in, you can kind of see like this is, this is one way to think about tinting neutrals in a bit more, with a bit more nuance than uh, simply by saying like, oh, I want like cool shadows, so I'm just gonna like whatever, like drop my lift, which as you can see, that's moving my entire curve, you know, or I'm gonna like, you know, up my, warm my gain or something like that. That's gonna move everything, uh, which isn't necessarily what we want in all cases. So that could be one solution is to look at sort of like gated uh, adjustments using your custom curves. All right. Uh, Frank wants, wants to know, to know about, about um, gamma, gamma for monitoring for a YouTube, YouTube output. output. Um, if, if, if the grading is for YouTube, YouTube, does that mean gamma 2.2 2 2 is the right is output? output? And also, and also assuming that's that what the monitor, monitor is set for, does that mean the output, output color space transform should also be gamma 2.2? Short answer, yes. Long answer, and I'd actually, this is like, we, the, Joseph, the next time you come on the show, we could uh, talk about this whole thing. Um, I'd be fascinated to get your take on this. But the longer answer here is there's like a very well adopted convention in motion imaging that says, if I am, you know, like right now I'm targeting, I actually should be targeting, t uh, well, no, this is good. I'm on 2.4 and my reference monitor is set up for 2.4, right? Now, there's a whole school of thought that says that intentionally mismatching your encode and your decode, think of these two as a handshake. So you've got forward encode, gamma 2.4, I'm encoding gamma 2.4, and my monitor is decoding gamma 2.4. What does that net out to? That nets out to linear. They cancel each other out one to one, right? So that's the sort of like basic convention and real idea of a gamma encoding of a forward encode and then a decode is we're just canceling each other out. We're trying to get back to neutral, right? But there's an entire school of thought that, sa that says you can compensate for differences in surround condition by using gamma. So the idea here would be like, let's pretend that I don't have lights on in this room. Let's pretend I'm not in YouTube mode, but I'm actually in here grading. I'm sending 2.4. I have a monitor that is set up for 2.4, okay? I master the image. The image goes out and it goes out to YouTube. It's being played on a device which has not a 2.4 response, but a 2.2 response. Now, the simple logic would be, well, I need to re-encode to 2.2 so that I'm getting that same cancellation of the forward uh, of the encode and the decode on that device as opposed to on my reference monitor, right? But there's a school of thought that says, well, when you encode 2.4 that is gonna be decoded as gamma 2.2, it's gonna be a little bit brighter. And that's gonna be beneficial because when you're grading in a dark room, it's gonna be easier to see than when you're looking at, it, looking at it in a bright surround. So you do an encode to 2.4 and then you decode uh, as you, you decode it as 2.2, it gets a little bit brighter and that essentially compensates for your surround. Like that's the logic that you'll hear out there. I don't subscribe to that logic at all. I don't see that making for a meaningful sort of compensation at all. I think it's a very, very loose compensation and it doesn't really compensate in the areas of the image where I would like to see compensation to account for differences in surround conditions. So there is that whole school of thought. I can't just disregard it because other people uh, are, because it's so like indoctrinated into our system. But my uh, notion is always like, just have the encode match the decode. And then if you need to change something or account for a different surround, then there are probably better levers to pull on than that one. That's my hot take uh, and uh, could all be summarized with the short answer of yes. 
Just match your encode to your decode and you should be good, which for most web devices is going to be 2.2 as opposed to 2.4. Um, let's see, camera team is wondering about output uh, settings. He's grading on a PC, uh, output is set to gamma 2.4, but someone uh, through cloud workflow is uh, doing the export, which is on a Mac and has gamma shift issues. How would you uh, smooth out that workflow? Oh, I'm excited to talk more about this. So here's the, the, the gamma shift thing. I'm, I'm working right now on uh, a what I'm calling the gamma shift guide, which is uh, intended to be a comprehensive, like one-stop guide to solving the gamma shift issue like the one you're talking about. But the first thing that we need to understand is like what we sort of collectively refer to as the gamma shift issue doesn't exist. There is no such gamma shift issue. There's like 20 gamma shift issues. There are a gazillion ways that what you saw in one environment doesn't look like what you would expect it to in another environment, whether that's a software environment or a physical environment or a hardware environment or some combination. There's a million reasons for that and they don't all have the same solution. So the number one like first step to solving this issue is to recognize there is no single gamma shift issue to be solved. In the situation you're describing, my first questions would be like, okay, well, what are you looking at it on on your side? What are the Mac users looking at it on on their side? And like, basically, where is the disagreement happening? If it's happening between reference monitor and something on your computer monitor, that could lead to a whole other line of question. Like, okay, what's the program that you're looking at it in? The low hanging fruit there would be QuickTime. QuickTime does not know what to do with Gamma 2.4 encoder material. It reproduces it incorrectly. So you can either game QuickTime if you want to solve locally for that, or you can say, I'm not going to use a piece of software that incorrectly reproduces my image. So that's just one example of this sort of like, uh, like garden of forking paths that you can end up with uh, trying to solve gamma shift where you're like, all right, where is the mismatch? What's the problem and what's the solution for it? There's a million different ways that can go down. And uh, even in your case, there's enough details that I don't know that I can't really answer uh, the question. But it really comes down to like, well, do you have an accurate baseline? Are you monitoring properly in the first place? Are you sending, like in this case, are you sending a 2.4 encode to a calibrated display that has a 2.4 decode? And is that your ground truth? And if that's your starting point, that can be the beginning of solving a gamma shift issue. And you can say like, okay, well, why am I getting an image that doesn't agree with that in this other scenario? If you don't have that, if you don't have a calibrated setup in the first place, there's not much you can really do because you're just talking about an image that was wrong to begin with and now it's just a different kind of wrong somewhere else. So the first step is definitely to have a calibrated image and then it's to patiently sort of like pull the sweater thread until you get to the other end. Like I said, we're working on that uh, to try to release at some point this year the Gamma Shift Guide that unpacks all of the different variations of this that I've seen and gives detailed instructions for like, here's what you're seeing, here's what the problem is, here's what the solution is, but it's actually incredibly comprehensive and like uh, varied when you start to look at all the different ways that gamma shift can come about. Uh, so uh, I hope that's at least some helpful framework and concept and maybe a little bit of encouragement that you're not missing something obvious. It's tricky stuff to solve and solving it for any one scenario kind of requires uh, a little bit of scientific uh, rigor to get to the bottom of it. Um, okay, guys. Wow. That went really fast. Let's, let's do one more if we got one more out there. Okay. Um, let's see. I want to change the question slightly. I think that may give an interesting answer. Uh, how would you take your grades from basic grades to a more pro grade? How do you upgrade your grades? Ooh, upgrade your grades. Did we just make our next YouTube video? That's a that's a, a, a that's a great idea for a YouTube video. Here's how I would upgrade my grades. Here's a, a really simple concept that. Uh, I, I uh, wish someone had emphasized to me way more in the, like, the beginning of my process. So I'm going to assume that you've got some of the basics that I talk about here on the channel all the time in place. You're color managing properly. You've got a look in place that supports your, your client's creative intent and that you like as well and that you're not fighting, but that's actually like 
getting you a stronger starting point than you would have had without it. You're doing all those things. You're working through the fundamentals that we talk about here on the channel all the time. You're setting your primary, you're working your balance, you're doing secondaries as needed, and you've got a fundamentally sound workflow and you're getting a sound image out of it as a result. How can you take that image and upgrade it and do more for it? Here's the number one thing you can do. Pay, pay more attention to your shadows. Pay more attention to the low end. If I wanted to broad that, broaden that out a little bit, I would say pay more attention to the edges of the image. By the time you apply the things that I just summarized, you're gonna have a sound image in the meat of the image. Like your subject is going to look good. The important elements in the frame are going to look good. Your colors are gonna render properly. Your contrast ratio is gonna feel decent. Those things are all gonna be in a pretty good slot. But what you really are gonna to wanna to focus on from there is the edges of things. And in particular, for me anyway, that comes down so much to the low end. Like what can you do to shape your shadows, to make them feel rich and deep, but like there's life in there and like nothing is crashing through the floor. Um, but whether it's working on your shadows, working on your highlights, or you know, like leveling up your power window game, I think it just comes down to like being able to see details that can subtly enhance or elevate the grade and starting to finesse those things into place in a nuanced way. So I'm not talking about like throwing up power windows that like, you know, like juice the contrast on uh, one object in the frame just to make it pop all that more. I'm talking about really beginning to shape and refine the image with that foundation that you've already laid that uh, is focusing on the less obvious things, the less like egregious things that you've already dealt with and just going to that next level of like, hey, what other care can I give to this image? How can I make this a more pleasing experience for the viewer? How can I help guide their eye to where it needs to go or away from where I don't want it to go? In the case of narrative, there's all kinds of uh, concerns like that that we can have as well. But that's where I would start to look at is like, look for the less obvious things, look for the details, look at the edges of things, whether it's the edge of your tonality or the edge of the frame, look for the details that it wouldn't be crazy to overlook because you've got the fundamentals in place, but if you've got the fundamentals in place, that's what's next is to start working on those details. And if you take a look at the work of any of the colorists that uh, are on like a you know like world-class level who I talk about here on the channel or who you admire, you're gonna notice that in their work is there's polish in every single frame. There's little details that might even be hard to notice, but everything feels really dialed and calibrated and sort of like slotted into a good position. So that's what I would uh, think about for upgrading your grades. Um, okay guys, y'all are awesome. Thanks for joining me for grade school. This was a good one. Uh, thanks to my buddy Gadali for co-hosting. Uh, like I said, we got another interview dropping very soon here on the channel, so keep an eye out for that. And I will see you guys back here next week for more fun uh, in uh, the color grading world and uh, for grade school next week as well. Take care, have a great weekend.